Section 1. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section 1. You will hear a woman talking on the phone to a hotel receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Atlas Hotel. Can I help you? Oh, yes. A friend has told me about your hotel, and I'd like to book some rooms, please. OK, when would you like to stay here? Well, we've booked flights on the 23rd of August. OK, I'll just find that date. The arrival date is the 23rd of August. So, 23rd August has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Atlas Hotel. Can I help you? Oh, yes. A friend has told me about your hotel, and I'd like to book some rooms, please. OK. When would you like to stay here? Well, we've booked flights on the 23rd of August. OK, I'll just find that date. That seems to be fine. We have a few rooms available then? Oh, that's good. I was a bit worried. We've left things rather late. Well, you're lucky. We had two cancellations last week. Oh! Now, how long do you want to stay for? Well, last year we only stayed a week, and it wasn't long enough. So, this time we thought two weeks, if it's possible. Hmm. That looks fine. Yes, you do need plenty of time here to really relax. It'll be getting towards the end of the tourist season as well, so it won't be quite so hot then. Oh, good. Um, we've got two children, and I was wondering if you have any rooms that are next to each other. Hmm, let's see... I'm afraid that isn't possible, but we do have what we call a family room, which is a lot bigger than a double room and can take two adults and two children. Oh, that sounds perfect. OK, I'll book you in for that. So, can I have your name and address, please? Yes, it's Mr and Mrs Shriver. Can you spell that for me? Yes, it's S-H-R-I-V-E-R. Thank you. And you said two children, didn't you? Yes. They're two boys of ten and twelve. Fine. And can I have your home address? Yes. We live at Flat 29, Tower Heights. OK. Is that England? No, it's Scotland, actually. We're from Dunbar. Ah. The postcode's EH41. 2GK. OK, great. That's a country I'd really like to visit. You'd have to bring a lot of warm clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And can I have a contact telephone number? Sure. Our home number is 0131 7, 
Thank you. I hope you don't mind, but we always ask our guests what the purpose of their trip is. I'm guessing yours is a holiday? Yes, we're really looking forward to it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. As you've been here before, I wonder if you'd mind answering a few short questions for our tourist board? No, not at all. They collect information from tourists so that they can try to improve the tourism industry here. That's a good idea. OK. Um, so, what type of holiday activity do you like best? Well, I like a lot of things. I like shopping and sightseeing. But I think as a family, we all enjoy swimming the most. OK. And do you go to the beaches to do that? Well, sometimes we do. We also like to sit around the pool at the hotel. When you go to the beaches, what do you think of them? Well, they're a bit crowded. I know. But then you expect that in the holidays. The main thing is that they're very clean. That's why we come back. I'm glad to hear that. And you said you like shopping? Yes, it's fun. How are the shop staff? Are they...? Well, I don't want to criticise, but sometimes... Well, they're a bit too helpful. Trying to sell you souvenirs? Yes. I prefer to choose things myself. Uh-huh. What about eating and the service in the restaurants? Oh, the food is delicious, always. And the waiters. Well, they're polite and so fast. Nothing takes very long. That's good news. Sometimes people complain, but... Well, I haven't been to every restaurant. There are rude waiters everywhere, I suppose. Well, we like to avoid it if we can. Do you have suggestions for things which might improve your holiday experience here? Um, not really. Let me think. Oh, yes. I did notice the last time I was there that there are local buses, but you don't seem to have any bikes. No, we don't. Most people have cars. Hmm. It's just nice to hire one and get some exercise. Go at a slower pace so that you can really see the landscape. OK, I'll note that down. Well, thank you very much. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear someone talking about a wildlife park. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. I'm a keeper here at Arana Wildlife Park, and that means that my job is to look after some of the animals that we have here. First, let me tell you a bit about us. Um, the word Arana means welcome in the local Māori language, and we are very pleased to see you all here. Oh. <laughs> As you probably know, we are run by a charity and we specialise in endangered species of animals, birds and reptiles. The park grounds cover 80 hectares of land and we have 400 animals altogether from 70 different species. So that you can see the animals in their natural environment, we've built streams and banks to separate you from the animals and make sure your trip around the park is safe. <laughs> Our animals come mainly from here, New Zealand, and from Australia, Africa and South America. There are a lot of animals to see and quite a number of things you can do here, so let me tell you about a few of the exciting encounters before you decide where to go. <clears throat> One of our most popular animals is a type of giraffe called a Rothschild. It's easy to spot. It has three horns rather than the usual two. Oh. Giraffes are amazing animals close up and you have an opportunity to hand feed them here at the park at 12 noon or 3 in the afternoon. This is one of the most popular activities and will be one that you'll never forget. Mm. In fact, we believe hands-on education is very important, so you can touch or pat a variety of friendly animals, such as cows and goats, at the farmyard. This experience goes on all day and is designed to help children take an interest in animals and their environment. I can assure you it's not at all dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Another exciting activity for visitors is watching some of our big cats reach speeds of up to 70 kilometres per hour during their exercise run. The cheetah is the fastest land mammal, and this event takes place at 3.40 every day. You can watch them go down their paddock in under 30 seconds. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, here's a plan of the park. As you can see, we're here at the main entrance and there's an information centre to your right. Now, it's quite easy to get around the park. We have daily guided walkabout tours which let you get up close to the animals. Or, if you prefer to be at a distance, you can take the safari bus and drive around with a wildlife expert. If you decide to take the walkabout tour, it leaves at 10.45, that's in just under an hour, from the meerkats enclosure next to us. From there, the walk passes the adventure playground and the otters in the first enclosure, and then arrives at the New Zealand birds area in the next enclosure, just in time to see them being fed. Then you go on to the reptile house and the tigers and the rest of the animals. Alternatively, you can wait until the afternoon walk. There are plenty of other things to see in the morning. One of these is the African village. Just turn to your right from the main entrance, walk past the first bus stop and it's just before the African wild dogs enclosure. It's a wonderful, colourful experience. You can also go to the shop and buy your souvenirs there. We have beautiful soft toys, giraffe and zebra, for children, 
and a whole range of T-shirts, hats and skincare products with an African theme. After that, why not have lunch in the picnic area on the far eastern side of the park? I'd recommend this because while you're eating, you might catch sight of the ostriches on one side of you or buffalo on the other. For the afternoon walkabout tour, you'll need to find your own way to the African lion habitat, which is on the west side of the park, just past the conservation centre. To join the tour, you actually go past the lion habitat. You'll see two bus stops, keep walking, and the meeting place is about half a kilometre after the second one. If you've gone past the zebra, you've gone too far. For those of you who would prefer to travel on the safari bus, this runs from 10.30 to 4pm. There are stations throughout the park, but the first one is at Jomo's Cafe, which is directly opposite where we're standing. Go straight ahead, and it's just in front of the giraffes. There are various feeding times for the animals, and the bus stops in time for all of these. So, let me just give you some safety guidelines. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students giving the results of a survey they conducted. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, now it's time for Sylvie and Daniel to give us the results of their survey into the study skills course that some of you did last term. Thanks, Mr. Driver. Um, shall I start, Daniel? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, as you know... Some students in our year did the study skills course run by the English department last term. Um, it was interesting because it was completely voluntary. It wasn't a compulsory component of the exam course or anything that we need in that way. But Mr. Driver thought it would be a good idea, that it would help with our other work. Yeah. So after the course finished, Daniel and I decided to review it, ask students what they thought about it, as part of our education assignment. Yeah. So, this is how we did it, uh, our study method. At first, we thought about interviewing students face-to-face, -face, but we have so much other work, and we knew it'd be quicker to use email and just send out a questionnaire. Though we also had to write that. Yes, and this method does rely on students filling it in and sending it back, but the response rate was pretty good. Yeah. Seventy percent, I think. Okay. So, first of all, 33 students signed up for the course. And we did 12 sessions over the term, and they took place every Monday morning. A good start to the week, I thought. Yeah. And the rest of the week, we could put things into practice. Hmm. So, what did we expect? For me, I expected it to be useful for all my subjects. Things like philosophy... Yeah, that's what Mr. Driver had said. And I was right. I feel more able to deal with difficult texts now. You know, like the ones we have in economics. You feel you can do it, 
Yeah, I think other people found that it actually made them want to read more frequently and read books outside the course list. If you've got time. Um, as for our teacher on the course, Jenny, everyone felt she was really good. We learned a lot from her. Not because she said a lot of homework or anything like that. The thing people said was that she gave us fascinating articles and ideas to work with, some of them. Well, we were quite happy to carry on looking at them at home. Yeah, that's so important. It's really easy to get bored in class, but that didn't happen. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, so we've done a couple of charts. Uh, let's have a look at the findings. I'll put up the first chart. This is your overall view of the usefulness of the course. And as you can see, only a small percentage of students didn't feel it was useful. Which is good. Yeah. Everyone else had a positive view of the course, and more than half of us, that's about 60%, thought it was very useful. Which, well, as this is the first time the course has been run, I guess this is a strong recommendation for it to take place again next year. The next chart shows how useful you felt each part of the course was. So, just to remind you, there was the speed reading component, that came out top. No surprise there, really. Mm. On the other hand, giving talks was, well, we all like talking, but it's not something we have to do that often. Yeah, so that was the least useful. Then the note-taking component you found to be quite useful, and you had a lot of comments about that. Okay, so let's have a look at some of your comments. You said a lot about the activities, but the main comment seemed to be that the techniques we learned on the note-taking course helped us focus more in lectures. Several people said that they daydream much less. Yeah, have a longer attention span. So that's the first benefit. The second is that students said they really appreciated the instruction on when to use a diagram to take notes. Mm. Like many people, I'd never thought of this technique, but now I find it really helpful. And it's much more fun. Yeah. And then the last comment we wanted to mention was about the type of paper that we used in the note-taking sessions. It seems obvious now that a wide margin down the side of the paper provides another area where you can add points that you've missed. And that makes it a lot easier to read the notes afterwards. Okay. So now we'll look at the results. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. You will hear a lecture about airport design. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Well, last week we looked at some of the architectural features of modern house design. And today we're going to move on to look at airport design and how this has changed over the years. So, if we start by going back to um, the 1960s and 70s, when there were a lot fewer airports than there are today, well, check-in desks, customs and waiting areas were all very basic. They were rather like a bus station, uh, designed to allow air traffic in and out of the terminal, but not very welcoming for passengers. Even though passengers spent a lot of time there, the important features were related to the flights, rather than the people who took them, or indeed the places where the airports were built. But that all changed in the next few decades. And if you look at any big airport now, it's more like a mini city. It combines a transport centre with a mall full of shops and facilities designed to make passengers feel more comfortable. So airports have been transformed. And as with any city building, their design now takes into account features outside the airport terminal as well. So why did this change happen? Well, there are two main reasons. The first was the huge increase in passenger numbers, in the number of people travelling by plane. And this was a direct result of mass tourism, with things like... Um, cheap holiday packages and low-cost airlines, with the construction of high-rise hotels and hotel complexes. And then people started travelling more regularly from one country to another for things like meetings, and so the growth in international business also pushed numbers up. In fact, passenger growth has been so significant over the past 30 years that it's estimated that some 21st century airports will need to handle up to 50 million passengers a year by 2020. The second reason for the change is, and this is a key aspect of airport design, people have realised that the airport is the first place you see when you visit another country. This means it forms your first impression of that country, and that impression has to be good. Airports are now called gateways to the cities they serve, and that raises visitor expectations. Now, what are the changes that have taken place in airport design? Well, the interior design, the inside of most airports, is now completely different. First, the dark, enclosed airports of the past have been replaced by large, open areas that look out onto the surroundings. Look at this picture of Beijing Airport. There's a huge amount of space and light, and this is typical of many airports today. Second, well, in the past, you had to go outside the airport to get trains to terminals, but now these are integrated into the design. Also, airport walkways are wide and can cope with the large volume of people, people who want to feel calm and relaxed, who want to get around the airport easily. In this way, the stress of modern travel has been minimised. Outside, the buildings have changed too. Airports were once ugly buildings with large towers and concrete boxes around them. Now they're designed to fit into their surroundings. Look at this picture of the Arctic Circle Airport in Norway. The airport itself is surrounded by mountains. So, as you can see... The roof of the airport has been designed so that it's shaped like a range of mountains. There are peaks at the top and then steep sides that touch the ground. In the same way, these airports in Thailand and India have beautiful shaded gardens all around them that reflect the landscape of the country. They also provide a connection with local tradition and art. Another feature that is important inside airports too. And there's one final but very important issue. It's been said that airports are a new building type. They're often light steel structures 
with what looks to the passenger like a lot of glass. But this is special glass that can maximise daylight and comfort and cut down on energy use. Bangkok's main airport is flooded with controlled daylight in a tropical climate. And this is achieved through the use of new materials and modern technology, which have also allowed engineers to come up with methods of reducing costs. So, let's take a closer look at some of these... That is the end of Section 4.